Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in London in Harley Street. And I'm delighted to be joined now um, by uh, George Macari. Uh, George Macari is the author of a recently published book entitled Soul Machine, The Invention of the Modern Mind. And we're going to be chatting about this book, very intriguing book. Um, George Macari is the director of the Dubert Wallace Institute for the History of Psychiatry and Professor of Psychiatry at Weill Medical College of Cornell University and adjunct professor at both the Rockefeller University and Columbia University's Psychoanalytic Center. Uh, Dr. Macari lives in New York City. So, uh, George, many thanks for joining us. Um, it's a fascinating book. Um, it's very readable. It's very gripping. Um, the title of the book is Soul Machine. Now, why that title? What is a soul machine? Well, first of all, Raj, thank you so much for having me on. It's a delight to talk to you about the book. Uh, soul Machine uh, is meant to be an intriguing title. It's meant to, to kind of push two terms together that seem to have nothing to do with each other and to begin an inquiry into the breakdown of the ancient duality between soul and body that led to the emergence of this third entity, the mind. So to put soul and machine together is to raise questions as much as it is to perhaps raise eyebrows. So the book is about an important moment in history. Um, I think, again, you're, you're, you're more of a historian than I am, uh, around the time of what's I think referred to as the Enlightenment, where you're arguing the, there's a fundamental upheaval in our understanding of our minds. Is that right? That's absolutely right. That, that you know, um, uh, philosophers frequently talk about the mind in a way that, that's ahistorical. I really wanted to understand how the notion of a secular mind, that is a natural mind, emerged, what the context was for its emergence, and what the debates and contests were that... Uh, really in many ways are with us today. So yes, I start in uh, a period of time of great upheaval, the early modern period, a period of time where uh, clerical authority is diminishing, secularism is starting to emerge, and the notion that inner life is not simply the supernatural soul, but something other than that. And it is also not simply reducible to a mechanical body, led to a series of challenges and opportunities um, that foisted forward the secular natural mind, a mind that could be either healthy or ill. But I, I, I got the sense that one of the points you were also kind of making is that way back then, they seemed to be asking questions, disturbing questions about what the actual nature of mind is. And I thought, and you must correct me if I'm wrong, you seem to be saying we kind of lost track of that and we should go back to that. We shouldn't take it for granted that we know what the mind is, was a sense of what I thought you were trying to say. Well, in, in many ways, I am trying to say that the questions that people were asking about the mind remain important ones. Uh, and, and I think, you know, what we've lost track of is uh, this, you know, divergence in, in, in cultures, really, where much of humanist culture, much of political culture, uh, much of common sense psychology places the mind front and center. We think when we wake up in the morning, uh, we are who we are because of our minds. We make choices about what we're going to do because of our minds. All of that seems so central, and yet I'm in a medical center uh, and, and at Rockefeller University where many of my colleagues who are scientists don't think there is such a thing as a mind. They are happy to reduce the mind to the brain and to the mechanics of brain function. So there's this wide divergence in Western culture between these two very important uh, aspects of that culture that I think have el eliminated the possibility of asking very important questions about the interaction of mind and brain, the interaction of the body as a machine, and this willing, thinking, intending uh, presence that we call the mind. 
But I also got the sense that you not only are an academic, a, a historian, um, someone who's making contributions to the humanities, that you work as a clinician. And I got a feeling that you believe that some of these questions are central to the, the clinical encounter, to the therapeutic process, that it's got a practical effect on the way doctors, psychiatrists work with patients and the way patients think about themselves. So that's what I thought came through as well for me from your book. Yes. Well, in fact, I think that is uh, implicit. And then at the very end of the book, I do try to make it explicit because what you see is communities organizing around particular notions. And then uh, patients who come to these communities really don't have the opportunity to be uh, examined, considered within the whole range of potential uh, uh, notions. They come to a neuropsychiatrist for a prescription, they come to a psychoanalyst for an interpretation, and any good psychiatrist, I think, struggles with that question. What actually is at stake here? To what extent am I, is it important for me to intervene at the level of neurobiology? To what extent is it important for me to intervene at the level of psychology or of environment? So, Psychiatry is a super interesting field because there's so much complexity that it's overwhelming. And my hope was that in going back and talking about how the mind emerged in a very complex time, that we would see its place in our culture in a way that was more unified with both the sciences and with seemingly disparate communities like the liberal arts. So um, the, the book is also written in a very poetic way, I thought. Um, you have this lovely comment at the beginning, um, and I'm going to paraphrase. You say that the mind today is everywhere and at the same time nowhere. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I, I meant to, uh, what I alluded to before, that, that common sense psychology, if you ask people why they do things that they do, what, who, why they are who they are, they will refer to something that has to do with their minds. They would uh, not be themselves if they didn't have their minds. Uh, and yet the most important ratifiers of truth in our society, which is natural science, refuses to verify that there's such a thing. So this is a quite curious state of affairs. Common sense, everyday psychology, and not just that, our politics, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the United States. Uh, you know, the, the, the rights of man. These are notions that are predicated on human beings who have free will to choose. They have secular minds. These are not souls that are either inhabited by spirits, have everlasting life, or uh, can be possessed. These are minds with the capacity to choose. So I, I argue that that discrepancy everywhere and nowhere is about a critical divide in Western culture. So I suppose you could say it's a very ambitious book. So yes, towards the end of the book, right at the end, you make this comment, which again feels very poetic to me. You say, um, their field would remain distasteful to physicists and poets, churchgoers and secular humanists alike. Stuck in a no man's land, these physicians became custodians of modern problems that no science wanted. And I think you're referring to psychiatrists I am and, and psychoanalysts there. Well, particularly psychiatrists, because what I talk about is that the, pro the, 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 the problems of integrating the secular mind into the body were overwhelming for the science of the time. There's, it's still overwhelming. So what happened in the late 19th century was disciplines created boundaries for themselves that eliminated the mind-brain problem. And so neurology, uh, after Hewlin's Jackson, essentially tries to take the tack that we can talk about parallelism, but really neurologists will look for neural causation, and they will not worry about neural and psychic interaction. Wundt and psychologists did the same thing. They walked away from interaction, which they were consumed with, but overwhelmed by, and said, we're going to just think about psychological causation. So each of them purified themselves of the mind-brain problem and became stabilized because of that. So academic psychology went off on its way. Neurology went off on its way. Psychoanalysis kind of followed psychology in that way as it walked away from biology. It said, we don't know about that. That's a black box. 
but psychiatry, I argue, that its raison d'etre, that its, that, that it, its reason for being, made it so that it could not walk away from the mind-brain problem and became, therefore, this unloved, unwieldy thing, this thing that seemed too reductionistic to poets, not scientific enough for, uh, for, sci for hard scientists, neither here nor there, because our culture had walked away from a major problem which nonetheless exists. So psychiatry, yes, is left holding the bag, but in a very important way, holding the bag in a way that is important for our patients for whom their problems don't easily often resolve by simply either psychology or neurobiology and frequently involve complex interactions. So one of the things that comes through in the book is that the difficulty in making breakthroughs in this subject, it feels to me um, the way that psychiatrists, and I want to focus a bit on Pinel, a French psychiatrist who features, la uh, features in, a, in a big way in, in the book, um, characters like him develop a reputation through what I'm going to describe, because it feels very modern to me, the, the celebrity cure. Um, so uh, King George at the time famously is mad and is cured by a doctor from Francis Willis. Um, and as a result, this man develops a reputation and his theories and his thoughts hold sway. And Pinnell snipes at this doctor and, and the, 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 um, the um, kind of like politics and, uh, of the moment is very beautifully evoked in your book. Tell us a bit about that, that moment. Okay, well, since your audience is British, I'm going to take it one further step back because really... Um, is central to my book is the role of John Locke. And John Locke, I argue, is, who of course was a physician as well as a political philosopher, studied with Thomas Willis, the, the founder of, of neuroanatomy, uh, was, I think, central to the notion of sculpting a secular mind. He, he was, of course, a, a believer and said the soul can be all of those things that exist in the afterlife but I'm going to take out of what commonly was called the rational soul functions such as will, memory, and reason. And I'm going to call those part of a secular mind. So that's a critical distinction. Shakespeare's mind doesn't make that distinction. But Locke is saying we need to talk about a mind that isn't supernatural, does not get access to absolute truths, but is provisional and therefore can break down. This is critical to the notion of psychiatry because if you have a supernatural soul, it can be possessed, but it can't be sick. It can't be healthy. Locke starts that, and Locke starts to attract over a great deal of time because doctors are very, very resistant to change, and they're using Galenic theories for 1,500 years. But eventually, in Great Britain, he starts to attract some, a few followers Mavericks, who started to use Lockean, essentially cognitive therapy. He thought that madness was due to misassociations. So if you have a wrong association, by kind of cognitive retraining and confrontation, you should be able to fix that up. So what the either minor or major illusions in every day. He therefore had some followers, including this, you know, kind of, slightly disreputable doctor named Francis Willis. So when King George became mad, uh, it was, of course, a catastrophe for the crown. It was unheard of. This was an absolute monarch. He was supposed to have close access to God, and now he was stark raving mad. They brought in the Galenic doctors. The Galenic doctors bled him and brought him close to death. And finally, his wife intervened and tried to get an alternative doctor, an alternative patient, brought in this guy, Francis Willis, who had developed a bunch of notions around Lockean ideas of behavioral modification and cognitive challenge and reframing. Francis Willis goes into what is now a wildly frightening and destabilizing event in all the newspapers of Europe, in all the newspapers in Great Britain, King George is mad. He goes in and starts to do what no one has done before, which is confront the king, cognitively reframe things. He used rather brutish methods of, uh, of interrogation and of reframing. 
lo and behold, the king was announced to be cured. Now, whether he was really cured or not is a completely different question. People say he's had you know, debates about what exactly was wrong with the king uh, and, and whether he was simply uh, cycling but, uh, through an illness is another question because he would get ill again. But nonetheless, this was announced throughout Europe and throughout Great Britain. And Mr. Dr. Francis Willis announced this with a coin that he minted that said the king is cured. Essentially, he could have written on the back, call me. People did start to call him and he started to extract extraordinary fees. But you know, at this moment in time, there is a huge rivalry, as many of our, the listeners you will know, between France and Great Britain. They have been rivals for a century. They have fought many wars together. And in France, the notion that the, the, the British know how to cure mental illness becomes alarming because no one else seems to know how to do it. And so this motivates a whole bunch of people to try to figure out what the British are doing. They're angrily uh, attacking the British for not revealing more about what they did. But then people like Philippe Pinel come along and it's after the revolution and the church is no longer there to inhibit discussion. The censors are no longer there, so you can talk about a rational mind that is not the soul, because before that you couldn't without the censor um, uh, coming after you. And Philippe Pinel goes into an asylum where already there is this guy called Poussin who's been working in behavioral kinds of ways with the mentally ill. And Philippe Pinel s starts to organize into four categories what he finds there four different mental illnesses and starts to use some of the same methods that the Lockean doctors were using in terms of trying to reestablish a kind of mind-body uh, homeostasis through behavioral, environmental, and mental um, uh, interventions. And this he becomes famous for, frequently called the, the, the father of, of, of psychiatry, of modern psychiatry, uh, uh, whether that's right or wrong, he nonetheless deserves a great deal of credit for what he did. And what you're referring to with the Lockean ideas, and, and Pinnell takes this on, is the notion of talking to the patient, entering into an argument with the patient, um, trying to get the patient to see things in a different way, but at the level of a conversation which tries to uh, makes assumptions that within the patient th there's a basic... Uh, rationality or logic that you can access and you can have an impact on the patient through this kind of direct conversation. Is that right? That's exactly right. Uh, that when when the, this old duality of body and soul existed, there was a moment where you had to triage people who were ill. The people who were ill in the body went to the doctors. The people who were ill in the soul went to the decisions of the soul, the priests. With the emergence of a secular mind, this third entity, that could be sick or healthy, there became the possibility of mental illness. Before that, you could be bodily ill, you could be possessed or inspired in the soul, but there really was no notion of mental illness. So now there's a notion of a mind that through its thoughts and its affects, could be ill. And that meant you should engage it at the level of the mind. That meant, as you said, talking. Uh, not just talking, but doing things like using high drama. They would stage fake scenes to try to get people to be convinced that their delusions could not be possible. They would try uh, environmental things like work cures and, and things that, uh, think interventions that seem to try to dissuade a person from indulging in a delusion or a repetitive thought. So people try different things at the level of the mind to create potential therapeutics. Now, there's a, there's a wonderful case you describe in great detail in the book, and there are many cases like this, but there's one in particular that struck me, was Pinnell encounters, I think, a watchmaker uh, in the asylum, and this watchmaker has a very strange delusion that I think he actually was beheaded and has had the wrong head put back on his neck. Could you say a bit about this case and what Pinnell did? 
Um, it, it's it's quite a, a disturbing story, but it became famous, and so that's exactly right. So in Pinnell's asylum, there were many people whose terrified delusions uh, had political significance, and so this was during the terror, and people were being beheaded, and so this fellow who was a watchmaker and very talented uh, a mechanic with mechanics uh, had developed a delusion that his, he had been beheaded and that uh, someone had grabbed the wrong head from the pile of heads, sewed it back on, so that when he looked in the mirror, there it was, the wrong head. Uh, so, so this was his delusion, and he was horrified. These are not my teeth. This is not my, these are not my eyes. What to do about this man who was suffering so terribly from this extraordinary delusion? Well, one of the things that Pinel and uh, his colleagues decided to do was to, in a way, we'd say, engage the healthier parts of his mind. They uh, engaged this man in what had been his passion, which was to create a perpetual motion machine. And so they brought him tools and they brought him uh, uh, machinery. And he became very involved in building and building something extraordinary. He was ex very talented in this way. And gradually, his delusions seemed to disappear. Now, when Pinnell wrote this case up, uh, it was uh, obviously uh, extraordinary. Uh, but interestingly, it then simply was copied in textbook after textbook. So this case becomes a kind of exemplary case for a number of other physicians, both in French-speaking and German-speaking lands, for what you do with someone who has developed a delusion. Try to engage their healthier interests in a way that allows them to be less attached to this delusion. And P.S., it's not a bad strategy. We, start, we still use it today. But what I thought was particularly fascinating about this case was the point I think you're making is that this rise of this notion that there's a thing called a mental illness also leads to a certain optimism that it's worth having a go because a lot of effort was put into helping this guy out. They went and got tools, brought them into the hospital, and they created a situation where he could become a watchmaker again. That can't have been easy for them to do. They put a lot of effort into this, I thought, no, and that, to, that, to have that energy to do yes. that. Yes, it's, it's really important because they had an optimism that it was worth a go. And I think that's fascinating. Look, I think that is a very important point that once you start to think of mental illness as something that is potentially uh, ameliorative, that you have the capacity to use therapeutics to change things. Now you've got something that energizes a lot of people and moral treatment, as it became called and moral often just meant psychological treatment, became wildly popular um, because um, folks started to report cure rates that were extraordinarily high. It turned out they were massively inflated. But nonetheless, in a way, the cure rates were symptomatic of how enthusiastic people were. These, this intervention at the level of mind and these therapeutics motivated people to build asylums. So you, what you find in 1838 is France builds out an asylum in every département uh, that the big asylums in Great Britain start to be built uh, because of this hope that you can, in fact, not just warehouse folks who are mad, but cure them. Those institutions were meant to be curative ones because of this set of assumptions and ideas. You also um, discuss another case, the famous case of the feral child of Avignon, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, in 1797. Now, this is an interesting contrast because this is a case where uh, people bring the new methods to bear, but maybe they, they're not quite as successful. And this, this brings in the tension of what are we dealing with with mental illness and how much of this is immutable brain disorder and how much of this is malleable. Could you tell us a bit about that case? Yes. Uh, in, uh, uh, in a rural town of uh, Aviron uh, in France, uh, there a boy appears uh, and uh, he seems to have been raised by wolves or God knows how. You have to understand in France at this time, there was so much poverty that 
um, parents uh, abandon children all the time. There were thousands and thousands of abandoned children in Paris. So children would get abandoned. Mostly they would die. Sometimes they would somehow survive. And this child, who was of an indeterminate age, but probably around 10 or so, uh, shows up in, in, this, uh, in, vill in this village. And he becomes almost immediately a test case for how much the moral therapeutics that Pinel uh, has established, how much it possibly can do. Because this is like a, going to be a, a lab uh, experiment to see if a boy who has no language and who seems to have had no environmental stimulation from other humans can grow to be, and what were they really concerned about? Moral, right? They want to see if they can make this a civilized human being. And can they teach him language? And can they teach him manners? And can they teach him empathy? And so this becomes this really um, uh, important, well-funded experiment that um, starts to uh, look for the limits uh, of mental therapeutics and uh, consider where mind and uh, its problems and, and development and biology begin. And again, what's really modern in feeling about this is that there's a debate as to, as to whether this child really did get very much better. And I, I, I think there's a wonderful sense of, of a modern feel to that, because to this day, rival doctors will debate and argue to what extent did a treatment work. Hence why we want things like double blind, randomized controlled trials. Hence the retreat into science uh, and measurement and numbers as a way of resolving this dispute, because you can see it starts back here. Was this child really cured or not cured? And it, they couldn't get very far with that argument, I thought. Yes, I, it, it's, it's, uh, I think you're absolutely right about that, that, you know, the confounding variables, of course, is the, the doctor who was deeply committed to treating this young man was deeply committed to seeing progress. Uh, interestingly, Philippe Pinel quickly turned against this former student of his because he was afraid that these claims were going to, uh, in fact, be shown to be false and therefore undermine his claims about moral therapeutics as well. Uh, he thought that this was going too far. So people took stances that were already quite biased because of their own stake in the game and uh, that's, of course, what we try to remove from uh, our understanding of clinical situations with things like double, pl double blind uh, screens. So, uh, you know, it, 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 at this point, they're not really able to do that. They're doing some, so there is statistics, of course, but, you know, uh, this is a case that isn't going to have an N of 60. <laughs> there aren't going to be 60, uh, you know, uh, children raised by wolves uh, that you're going to be able to compare. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time. It's a fascinating book. There are many other things we could discuss, but I want to pick up on one, two, one or two other quick points. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of interesting bit of history that I think has been forgotten, I, I, in my opinion. I, I'm not an expert in this area, and I think you revive it, which is the role of the private hospitals in saving members of the aristocracy who got themselves admitted in order to avoid the guillotine. Um, could you say something about that? Because I also thought this had a remarkably modern feel about how psychiatry could become political. Um, it, it's a unique branch of medicine. And we can think about the Soviet abuses of, of the politicization of psychiatry um, in, in the 60s and, and before that. But, but the, I thought it was a wonderful moment in history where you can see it beginning to happen here. Could you tell us a bit about what happened? Yeah, sure. Uh, it is an example of probably of many fields of the way they can get corrupted. But uh, uh, yes, the, so there were private hospitals in France. Uh, and when uh, the revolution occurred, of course, if you were an aristocrat, it was a very, very dangerous time. There were very few places to hide. You could flee the country. Uh, but another refuge, if you will, was to uh, be declared insane and go into one of these private maisons de santé and, 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 and uh, be hidden there. Uh, it happened that Philippe Pinel was a junior physician at one of these places uh, with a very corrupt uh, uh, owner who would fleece these aristocrats and take everything he possibly could from them. And then when they had run out of money, he would discharge them <laughs> to the guillotine or whatever their fate might entail. Uh, 
So it was a, it was a, you know, a simple act of, of corruption, a, a swindle, if you will, in which uh, the authority of, of, uh, of this, you know, really nascent field of mental medicine was used to uh, uh, exploit desperate people. Um, but also, I, I thought the notion of the mad doctors, they were referred to in, in the Victorian era as a wealthy doctor, as, as, as a doctor who made a lot of money, um, uh, was an interesting idea. Because today in, in medicine, um, young medical students who want to make a lot of money think about becoming surgeons. They don't think about becoming psychiatrists. But it seemed to me that, 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 these, the, that, that this was a methodology by which um, psychiatrists of the day w could become um, obviously unscrupulously, but could become extremely wealthy people, was what I thought was being well, said. Not, well, not exactly, because the owner of the institution was rarely a psychiatrist. Ah, okay. Right. <laughs> the owner of the institution was the owner of the institution, and, and they hired doctors, and often not too many. Uh, you know, scandalously, right. these places um, initially emerged with no doctors, and uh, were simply holding cells where you families would dump people that they couldn't take care of. So uh, uh, I'm afraid that uh, the real money wasn't going to the docs. Okay, okay. But still, I'm still interested in the idea that there was a respect for these institutions, that the, the mob didn't, didn't invade them to, to grab hold of the aristocrat and bring them out and hang them. Yeah, there was no, still that's some kind of respect. No, that's an interesting question. I, I can't really... Uh, uh, illuminate that, uh, but it but it is interesting. They the the mob certainly didn't hold back in many other institutions. So why not this one? This the, by the way, the owner of this institution was uh, eventually uh, denounced uh, and and imprisoned. Uh, so the Jacobins, I think, eventually got to him. Uh, but uh, amazingly, he survived the revolution and reopened his institution a few years later. So uh, that's that's a that's a that's a that sounds like a telenovela or something. Right. OK. Well, listen, uh, Dr. Makari, it's been wonderful talking to you. It's an amazing book. The book is entitled Soul Machine, The Invention of the Modern Mind, written by George Makari, uh, published by Norton. And as I said, a fascinating read, very readable indeed, and also raises very serious questions about assumptions doctors and patients make today about what the nature of mind is, which underpins therapy. And I think it's a very thought provoking book that says we shouldn't take for granted uh, the, 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 the assumptions that we're making in the, in the modern world and, and why it's very important to understand this moment in history. So, uh, Dr. Makari, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's been lovely talking to you.